Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Xavier Solomon. I'm the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator here at the Frick. And it is a huge pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, someone I have long admired across the ocean, uh, Caroline de Guito, who is um, one of the great forces behind the study and display and exhibitions and research at the Royal Collection in England. She has worked there for 20 years, which I didn't, couldn't quite believe when I read that in her CV. I'm, I'm sure she was five years old when she started. <laughs> and um, she very recently was promoted in last, just last year, in 2019, as the deputy surveyor of the Queen's works of art. Now, when I think about everything I'm looking after at the Frick, it feels daunting when I realize that she is looking after 700,000 objects that belong to royal family in the UK, which are also spread across 13 royal palaces. So it's not just Buckingham Palace and Windsor, but many other uh, residences. Um, Caroline has worked on a number of exhibitions and research projects in uh, the royal collection. And her most recent exhibition, which is linked to tonight's lecture, uh, was on last year, and it was entitled Russia, Royalty, and the Romanovs. And it was really an exhibition, a fascinating exhibition, that looked at the relationship between the, the British royal family and the Russian imperial family. But of course, there were a lot of um, family links and other links that I'm sure we'll hear all about tonight. Uh, but going all the way back to the 17th century and onto the 19th century. Um, she has worked on a number of volumes uh, about the decorative arts in the Royal Collection, and they focus on a range of objects from jewelry to fashion uh, to broader issues to do with the decorative arts, metalwork, uh, and, and so on. But her real focus of interest, I would say, in the last few years, uh, if not more, has been the work of Peter Carl Fabergé and, of course, uh, the work of this great Russian genius, uh, which is so incredibly well represented at the Royal Collection. Um, I was lucky enough a year ago to be part of the Royal Collection course, which invites foreign scholars, scholars from all over the world, to uh, be for a week with the Royal Collection and learn about it. And to me still, uh, one of the most incredible experiences there was to look at a selection, a small selection of the Fabergé from the Queen's Collection with Caroline. It was just absolutely eye-opening and marvelous. She is now working on the catalog of that collection, the full catalog resume of Fabergé in the Queen's Collection, which is due for publication next year in 2021. And she was just telling me it's about 900 objects, which I didn't realize there were quite as many. And I'm sure they're all incredibly wonderful. Um, so tonight, Caroline will talk about the art of diplomacy, collecting Russian art in the age of Queen Victoria. This is a time to remind you all, please, to turn your phones off. Uh, this lecture is recorded live and will be available for future viewing on our website. And just to tell you all that the West Gallery and the Enamels Room will remain open for about um, half an hour after the lecture until about 7.30. So please feel free to go into the West Gallery and have a look around. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming Caroline de Guito. <clears throat> well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a huge honor for me really to be here this evening and to have the opportunity to speak in this wonderful institution that um, has always been at the top of my list whenever I've had the, the pleasure of visiting New York. And I'd like to extend a, a huge thank you to, um, to Xavier for arranging this, to all his team, and of course to Ian Wardropper, the director, for allowing this all to happen, particularly as, in a way, I'm rather daringly speaking about uh, something which is, has little connection, really, to the wonderful collections here at the Frick. So, during the long reign of Queen Victoria, from 1837 to 1901, four emperors ruled Russia. Nicholas I died of pneumonia, although he was rumored to have committed suicide. Alexander II was assassinated. Alexander III died prematurely of kidney disease at the age of 49. And Nicholas II, as we know, was murdered by the Bolsheviks on the 16th of July, 1918, thus bringing to an end more than three centuries of the Romanov dynasty's rule. Queen Victoria died relatively peacefully of a stroke at the age of 81 on the 22nd of January, 1901, at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. 
The complex political relationship between Great Britain and Russia and their respective rulers is well documented in the many political histories written of this period. Queen Victoria being a constitutional monarch who nonetheless was the figurehead of millions of people across the British Empire, viewed her Russian counterparts who were autocratic absolute rulers of the vast Russian Empire with great suspicion. In 1878, the Queen described the country thus, Russia, our worst enemy in her policy of ambitious aggression and duplicity. Her Russian counterparts were no less mistrusting of the British. Nicholas I, who had allied himself with the conservative rulers of Austria and Prussia, regarded Britain with its taste for democracy as dangerously subversive. The vast personal correspondence Queen Victoria produced during her reign and her, indeed her life, together with the unique insight we have from her journals, those are her personal diaries, many volumes of which are preserved in the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle, chart this political relationship through her observations, as well as giving a fascinating insight into the personal relationships between the British royal family and the Romanovs. But what also survives in the royal collection and in the former collections of the Russian imperial family is a fascinating and rich body of fine and decorative art, much of it uh, exchanged as diplomatic or personal gifts between the sovereigns of each nation. Each work of art is a gift and thus embodies an expression of gratitude to the recipient. And each illustrates in most instances the best of native craftsmanship, while, as we shall see, they also often reveal something of the personality and artistic interests of the donor and a desire to give something which they know the recipient will value and most importantly, enjoy. The first Russian work of art to enter the royal collection during Queen Victoria's reign and arguably one of the most impressive due to its enormous scale, it stands more than two meters high without its stone plinth, was this Malachite vase. It was produced in 1836 and was sent by Emperor Nicholas I as a thank you present to the Queen following the visit of his eldest son to England, the future Alexander II, who the Queen had received at Windsor Castle. Despite doubts as to the Grand Duke's security, his visit had passed off without incident, and the emperor wished to express his pleasure regarding the reception given to his son by Queen Victoria via the British ambassador in St. Petersburg, Lord Clanricard. Later in the year, during an audience with the emperor, the ambassador was informed of the emperor's intention to present the queen with a malachite vase from the hermitage. It was dispatched on the steamer SS Sirius, which sailed from Kronstadt on the 16th of August, 1839. In Queen Victoria's journal for the 22nd of August, she records, the emperor is going to send you a present, Lord M said, that is Lord Melbourne, her prime minister. I said, no, and he continued quite touched, a malachite vase, they say it's the finest in the world and it stands in his palace at present. Nicholas I was instrumental in introducing monumental hardstone vases to the decoration of the new hermitage, the purpose-built museum that he created at the Winter Palace to house the imperial art collections after this part of the palace had been destroyed by fire in 1837. This watercolor shows the main entrance hall and the elegance of the design by the German architect Leo von Klenz who Nicholas employed to create the renovated space. The massive granite columns are combined with large vases carved from richly colored hardstones found in Siberia. While decorative items were carved from hardstone all over Europe, the scale and sophistication of Russian vases are unique. There were three main lapidary or stone carving factories and they worked almost exclusively for the imperial household. The first hardstone carving factory had been established at Peterhof much earlier, in fact, by Peter the Great in 1721 as part of his efforts to introduce the European decorative arts to Russia. And it was at the Peterhof factory that this vase was made. 
The archives of the factory record the costs of producing the vase, which amounted to the astonishing sum of 40,000 rubles, which is the equivalent to about $500,000 in today's uh, money. Leading architects would design the vases as well as their intricate gilt bronze mounts, and they generally echo the French Empire style, but the Russians would add an extra richness and much of the work they produced in terms of hardstone is of an unsurpassed quality. For all this vase, the gilt bronze work alone cost 24,200 rubles, so nearly as much as the vase, uh, the Malachite itself. Oh, sorry. Just to point out, the photograph on the right shows the original height of the hardstone uh, pedestal, which actually is made of Putilov stone, and that at some point in its history, after the date of this photograph, 1931, was actually uh, reduced in scale, um, the reasons for which we don't actually uh, know. Um, the Queen had placed the vase in the grand reception room at Windsor Castle, and uh, as we've seen, it was really quite a monumental piece, particularly on that very high plinth. And here, rather catastrophically, you can see um, the aftermath of the fire at Windsor Castle, which took place in the autumn of 1992. But what is rather wonderful is that the vase itself, um, which you can't see because it's hidden, but it's there, uh, actually survived this really devastating fire, which, as you can see, almost completely destroyed the room. And the photograph on the right shows the grand reception room in its restored state five years later when the restoration was completed in 1997. At the time of its production in 1836, this vase was the largest malachite vase ever produced. And it was recorded in the catalogue of the Hermitage collection compiled in 1837. The emperor had decided to place it in the Hermitage and in the records it was described as follows. By order of the Minister of the Imperial Court, the large porcelain vase bearing portraits of Emperor Alexander I was moved from the round hall in the Hermitage and in its place was installed a new large vase of malachite. In many ways, it seems rather surprising that Nicholas I would part with such a significant object. And there is evidence to suggest that afterwards he may well have missed the vase and possibly even regretted his decision, because in 1841 he commissioned a second vase of almost identical design and scale to replace it, um, and the one he had given to Queen Victoria. And this second one was designed by the architect Carlo Rossi, who'd been uh, working almost exclusively in the Russian imperial court, designing some of the most famous buildings uh, created around the Hermitage during Nicholas I's reign. And the replacement vase was positioned in the vacant position of the previous vase given to Queen Victoria at the top of the council staircase, where it remains today, as you can see in this image. The marriage of Queen Victoria to her first cousin, Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha took place on the 10th of February, 1840, at the Chapel Royal St. James's Palace, as recorded in Sir George Hayter's group portrait of the event. This was the moment for the receipt, of course, of many wedding gifts, and the Emperor of Russia sent a surprisingly personal one. He commissioned the Russian artist Karl Timolian von Neff to make portraits of his wife, the Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna, and of his two daughters, Maria and Olga. Von Neff had succeeded the artist Karl Brulyov as painter to the imperial family and was a rising star in the Russian court. The gift of the portraits may partly have been motivated or at least encouraged by the Empress consort Alexandra. Born Princess Charlotte of Prussia, she was the eldest surviving daughter of King Friedrich Wilhelm III, and her marriage to the future Nicholas I on the 1st of July 1817 was a political union forging closer ties between the two countries. However, it appears that the couple were ideally suited, and their relationship was very much regarded as a love match. Alexandra Fyodorovna sat for the British artist George Dorr in this portrait in 1821. Dorr was one of the most 
important British artists working in situ at the Russian imperial court during this period of the 19th century, demonstrating, in fact, the continuing cultural exchange of artists and craftsmen between the two countries, which had begun under Peter the Great with his establishment of the capital of Russia in St. Petersburg, and which had attracted numerous British settlers to the opportunity of a new European-focused royal court. In fact, Daw spent 10 years in St. Petersburg in the service of Nicholas I's predecessor, Emperor Alexander I. Not only did he paint the imperial family, including this portrait, which Prince Albert himself acquired in 1844, and which served as the model for all subsequent large-scale portraits of Alexander I, but he also completed a remarkable 322 portraits of Russian generals and dignitaries who distinguished themselves in the Napoleonic Wars. And these portraits were inserted into the war gallery in the Winter Palace, which Alexander I created as a celebratory gallery and which opened on the 25th of December, 1826, the anniversary of Napoleon's expulsion from Russia. This triumphant uh, or triumphal military gallery was mirrored in England by George IV's creation of the Waterloo Chamber at Windsor Castle, which you can see below. Uh, this was painted um, and hung with portraits uh, uh, commissioned from the famous British portraitist Sir Thomas Lawrence, and also likewise very much celebrated the defeat of Napoleon. And it was completed, in fact, much later during the reign of William IV, as seen in Joseph Nash's uh, watercolour on the screen. The visit of Emperor Nicholas I in 1844 was a major event. The first visit of a Russian emperor in 30 years since Alexander I's own visit uh, to the Prince Regent in 1814. The emperor himself saw it as a watershed in relations between the two countries, and the respective ministers of the two countries laid careful plans, with Sir Robert Peel, Queen Victoria's Prime Minister, explaining to the Russian ambassador, de Brunov, I spoke to the Queen and Prince Albert. They were greatly pleased at the prospect of a visit from the emperor. The Queen and Prince were really personally gratified at the thought of having the emperor under their roof. This medal was struck to commemorate the event and is inscribed as follows, Nicholas I, Emperor of all Russia, friend and guest of Queen Victoria of the Britons, 1844. The visit itself lasted 10 days in June and was considered to be an enormous success. Although having said that, Queen Victoria's attitude towards the emperor seemed to seesaw. In her journal on the 9th of June, she wrote, I then gave him for the empress a bracelet of enamel and diamonds containing my hair, begging the emperor to place it at his feet. Albert returned with a sketch of the Waterloo Gallery at Windsor, which I had had done for the emperor. I told him at the same time I would send him, when it was completed, a cup similar to the one I had given at Ascot Races, which he had so much admired. I think that our simple and unaffected reception of the emperor in our home life, as well as the honor and civility shown him without any ostentation, have made an impression on his mind. But one has to keep in mind that he has been brought up with the greatest severity by an autocratic and unsociable mother, the father having been a madman and a perfect monster. Nicholas I certainly didn't always get it right, and certainly not in Queen Victoria's eyes. And this was true when it came to the collections of the imperial family. He sometimes, in fact, made really rather disastrous decisions. For example, he sold off over 1,000 paintings from the collections, some of them of really high importance, and he had many others destroyed if he didn't like them. He also melted down several of Catherine the Great's gold and silver dinner services, over 3,000 pounds of metal in all, and he had new ones made in a style that he preferred. His London service, which was intended to serve 50 people, 
included 1,680 pieces and was ordered from the crown jewellers in Britain, uh, Garrods, and also from Hunt and Roskill and other British silversmiths. And these were particular silversmiths whose workshops he had taken the opportunity to visit uh, whilst he was in England visiting Queen Victoria. And amongst this service were seven large sculptural groups to decorate the centre of the table, one of them being a copy of the Queen's Cup, which had been made for presentation at the Ascot races in 1844, and which Victoria, um, of course, had given him. As we've heard, Queen Victoria gave and promised several gifts, both for Nicholas I and for Empress Alexandra. And in return, the emperor made a remarkable series of gifts to the queen, which arrived throughout the rest of 1844. This elaborate table, or guéridon, has gilt bronze mounts designed and made in the workshop of the Finnish-born silversmith and bronze worker, Karl Johan Tegelsten. He had qualified as a master craftsman in 1825 in St. Petersburg, and from around 1833, much of his work was retailed by the renowned company Nichols and Plink, one of the most fashionable shops in St. Petersburg, which had been founded in 1789 and was owned by a succession of Englishmen, including Charles Nichols and William Plink. It was particularly known for its fashionable designs and meticulously executed bronzes. And the shop regularly supplied the imperial cabinet with all manner of silver goods and furnishings and was mainly familiarly known as the English shop or the Magasin Anglais. And it was awarded the imperial warrant to become an official supplier to the Russian imperial court in the 1840s. Inset into the top of the table is a circular panel of Russian hardstone, which was made in the Peterhof Imperial Lapidary Workshops and is listed in the uh, records there at a value of 5,715 rubles. The beautiful and delicate flower bouquets um, are carved in relief from a range of different hardstones. And the design itself also, as you can see, incorporates insects and butterflies within a lapis lazuli Greek key border. The design of the magnificent bouquet was supplied by an Austrian floral painter called Joseph August Satori, uh, who came from Vienna and who was commissioned to supply several floral compositions by the Peterhof uh, Lapidary Factory. In 1839, he visited St. Petersburg and he participated in several academic exhibitions as a floral painter. And his works caught the eye of Empress Alexandra and she acquired at least one of his paintings during that time. And one of his designs was used for the lapidary top, which is remarkably similar to the one presented to Queen Victoria, which was made for Empress Alexandra in 1842, just a couple of years before Queen Victoria's. The table sent to Queen Victoria arrived in December 1844 and was placed in pride of place. You can just see it here. Um, in the window bay of the white drawing room at Windsor Castle, one of the principal reception rooms in the semi-state apartments. And she viewed it on the 2nd of December and described it in her journal as the Pietra Dura table, which the Emperor of Russia has sent me. At the same time, on exactly the same day, she also viewed another of the Emperor's gifts in the green drawing room, which had arrived in the same shipment from Russia. The shipment, in fact, came in a total of eight cases, transported on the steamer Mermaid. And when she viewed the vase, she described it as a splendid and immense piece. This was, in fact, one of the largest vases executed by the Imperial Porcelain Factory in St. Petersburg. And it measures over one and a half meters in height and just over a meter in diameter. It's entirely made from porcelain, with the exception of the handles and the rim around the top, which are cast from gilt bronze. Nicholas I, in fact, showed an unprecedented personal interest in the production and decoration of this vase. Decorated with matte and burnished gold, it is also painted on each side with a view of one of the imperial palaces by one of the porcelain factory artists called Nikolai Konolovich Kornilov. 
One painting that you see here is a view of Peterhof, the imperial palace established by Peter the Great across the Gulf of Finland. And uh, it was directly copied from the original, which was commissioned from the famous Russian marine artist, Ivan Ivazovsky. The original painting was one of six ordered by Nicholas I in 1844. And these were placed in the emperor's private rooms at Peterhof. And he himself personally selected this specific view uh, to be copied and painted onto the vase. On the other side is a topogra topographical view of Saskoy Solo, which means Tsar's village. And this was the complex of imperial palaces in the countryside outside St. Petersburg. The watercolor view was prepared at the emperor's request by Vasily Sadovnikov. And it also bears an inscription indicating that it was specially prepared to serve as the model for the vase destined for Queen Victoria. There was considerable debate between the emperor via the minister of the imperial court, Prince Pyotr Volkonsky, and also uh, with the factory, as to what should be painted on the sides of the vase. And this went on for many, many weeks. Um, the options appeared to be uh, uh, the imperial monograms, floral ornament, or perhaps a coat of arms. And eventually the decision was made by the emperor himself to apply the sides between the two uh, views of imperial palaces with the British royal arms, which you can see here. The queen was evidently very pleased with the vase and in her letter of thanks to the emperor wrote that the vase is superb is placed in the drawing room where we spend our evenings and it is admired. A further letter kept in the same Russian State Historical Archives file records that as a gift of thanks for such a magnificent vase, Queen Victoria sent a gift in turn to the emperor. And this was also a gift of porcelain in the form of the so-called orders service. The queen had noticed that while at Windsor, the emperor had admired a service of which they presumably dined, which was decorated with the British orders of chivalry, and in fact had been made for uh, William IV in 1831 at the Worcester Porcelain Factory. Nicholas I, uh, seeing this service, would have been reminded uh, of some services in Russia, which would have been uh, enormously familiar to him. And these had been commissioned by previous Russian sovereigns, in this case, uh, in the 1770s, by Catherine the Great, who had ordered from the Moscow porcelain manufactory of the English businessman, Francis Gardner, services decorated with the ribbons, badges, and stars of the most senior imperial orders of chivalry. The services were continually added to with replacement pieces during successive reigns, including that of Nicholas I. For the emperor's gift, the queen decided to commission the Colport porcelain manufactory uh, to uh, which uh, she and Prince Albert placed many, many commissions during their reign to produce the particular service for the emperor. And as you can see, um, it very closely replicated the design of the service made for William IV with this heavily um, gilt decoration, the same royal blue background. But to substitute the decoration of the white reserves, instead of the British orders of chivalry, we have, of course, the Russian orders of St. George, St. Alexander Nevsky, St. Vladimir, St. Stanislas, the White Eagle, and St. Anne. And in the center, rather than the royal arms on the prototype, we see the senior Russian order of chivalry represented by the badge of the Order of St. Andrew. The original dessert service consisted of 62 pieces and was sent directly to the Winter Palace. But the emperor decided to use it for large banquets and commission an additional 124 pieces from the Imperial Porcelain Factory in St. Petersburg to supplement the service. Um, and as you saw just there, a substantial number of pieces, in fact, are still located in the Hermitage Museum today. In a letter to the emperor dated the 1st of July, 1845, which accompanied her gift of porcelain, Queen Victoria wrote to him that these objects which I send to you are my portrait by Winterhalter and a porcelain service similar to that which you admired at Windsor. Well, we've seen the porcelain service and the portrait which the Queen sent is almost certainly a copy of this one. 
Here, of course, she is depict depicted in typical regal uh, splendor, dressed in the mantle of the Order of the Garter. She wears the diamond diadem, and beside her on the table are the imperial scepter and the imperial state crown. And in the background, we have a glimpse of the southeast corner of Buckingham Palace, which the emperor had visited uh, during his stay in 1844. The Queen recorded in her journal on the 30th of September 1843 that she and Prince Albert looked at Winterhalter's full-length portraits of us both, which are now quite finished and really splendid, both as to painting and likeness. And in 1899, much later, she remarked that it was the portrait that she liked best. And as a result, many, many copies of this portrait were produced, largely made to be given away as state gifts. The leading German court portraitist, uh, Franz Zave Winterhalter, was first brought to the attention of Queen Victoria by the Queen of the Belgians. And subsequently, he painted numerous portraits at the English court from 1842 until his death in 1873. And the Queen and Prince Albert admired his ability to capture likenesses so accurately. But Winterhalter is equally renowned for his ability to depict the rich fabrics and textiles which so often adorn his royal sitters. In this portrait, which the Queen commissioned as a birthday present for her Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, the Prince of Wales, later Edward VII, wears a Russian-style blouse, an adaptation of a 17th century uh, traditional Russian shirt. And in her journal, Queen Victoria recorded on the 8th of October, 1843, that the Prince of Wales appeared at luncheon in his new blouse, which he is always to wear now. It is in fact a Russian dress. The shirt uh, that he wears here may in fact have been a gift from Grand Duke Michael Pavlovich, the brother of Emperor Nicholas I, who was then at that moment visiting the royal family. Less than a year later, during Nicholas I's visit in 1844, Queen Victoria sketched Bertie, as he was known, wearing a Russian-style dress, but also wearing the star and ribbon of the Grand Cross of St. Andrew, with which the emperor had presented him. And the insignia uh, still remain in the royal collection today, along with the Queen's sketch. And it seems that this fashion for Russian dress probably uh, inspired by this increasingly close relationship between the Queen and the Russian Emperor, persisted. And in one of Winterhalter's, in fact, most famous group portraits of the royal family, painted in 1846, of which I just show you a small detail here, the Prince of Wales, sitting next or standing next to his mother, is once again attired in a Russian costume, this time in a rich red uh, fabric with gold braid. The aftermath of the 1844 visit was marked by yet more gifts exchanged between Nicholas I and Queen Victoria. Following the visit, the emperor commissioned this portrait as a gift for the queen, which was not completed, in fact, until 1847. In the selection of the artist Franz Kruger, it is clear that Empress Alexandra profoundly influenced her husband. Her taste, formed in the artistic milieu of the early 19th century uh, Berlin meant that many German painters inevitably flocked to Nicholas I's court. We've seen that a German architect, Leo von Klentz, had built the new hermitage, and Nicholas I also made an extensive collection of contemporary German sculpture. As soon as the couple were married and moved into the Winter Palace, the emperor began to add paintings by Kruger, the Berlin court painter, who became a great favorite and a great uh, Russian court artist. The monumental scale of this painting, the canvas measures over three and a half meters uh, in height and two and a half meters in width, is impressive. And Queen Victoria records on the 10th of November, 1847, the Russian ambassador presented a fine full-length portrait of the Emperor of Russia, which is an excellent likeness. At the time of his visit three years earlier, she had described the Emperor as very striking. He is still very handsome, very tall, with a very fine figure and beautiful Grecian profile. The scale of the painting 
uh, which probably would have suited an enormous Russian imperial palace, appears to have been rather difficult to accommodate uh, in an English palace, albeit one on quite a large scale. And as a result, the Queen, in fact, commissioned uh, the artist William Corden, the younger, to create a copy uh, of the portrait so that she could insert it into one of the hangs at Buckingham Palace in the 1844 room, which is in fact one of the rooms which the emperor had occupied during his uh, visit. The original painting was later moved to Windsor Castle, where it was photographed hanging in the guard chamber in 1931. You can see it here. And it was taken down prior to the Second World War. And the canvas was rolled up, in fact, for almost 80 years until it was recently conserved for exhibition. And I just wanted to include these images. Some of my colleagues very kindly posed in front of the painting because it's quite difficult to appreciate just how large this canvas is. It's very, very large. And also uh, what deserves attention is this spectacular Rococo revival frame with sprays of oak leaves and palm fronds, and also unquestionably Russian and unquestionably imperial, the Russian imperial eagles and crown in the four corners. By the early 1850s, the Royal Collection contained many remarkable works of Russian art. And at the Great Exhibition of 1851, the first of the grand artistic and industrial exhibitions, which was the brainchild of Prince Albert, and which was mounted under the royal patronage of both him and Queen Victoria, it afforded a great opportunity for the finest of Russian craftsmanship to be displayed on the world stage for the first time. On one of her more than 20 visits to the Great Exhibition, Queen Victoria was impressed by the plate, jewelry, and malachite furniture, and remarked in her journal, we went first to look at the Russian exhibits, which have just arrived and are very fine. Doors, chairs, a chimney piece, a piano, as well as vases in malachite, specimens of plate, and some beautifully tasteful and very lightly set jewelry. It appears that um, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, oh, sorry, very much in the um, Russian taste, uh, these pieces were in fact created in the uh, workshops of the Demidov family. And um, in fact, Queen uh, Victoria and Prince Albert would go on to acquire one of these pieces immediately after the end of the Great Exhibition. Prince Albert purchased this vase, which you could see in the display and you could also, in the photograph of the display, and you can also see just in this detail of the watercolor we saw previously. Um, and he purchased this vase on the 25th of June, 1851. The monumental vase and pedestal, along with the doors also displayed, and the two other vases, as I've said, were made in the Demidov lapidary factory. And the noble Demidov family had been granted lands in the Ural Mountains in the 17th century, where they discovered metal and precious stone deposits in very large quantities. And by the 19th century, they became proprietors of numerous mines and foundries. And one of them, the famous Nizhny Tajil mine, was renowned for its malachite. Malachite, of course, is a very brittle stone. And for large pieces such as this, it has to be used as a veneer, which is applied in what the Russians refer to as a mosaic technique to a solid core. This was, uh, this was often made of stone, but occasionally could be made of metal, as in the case of this vase. And the skill required is highly specialized, and pieces took many, many years to make. The doors, for example, that we saw exhibited uh, at the Great Exhibition took 30 men over a year to create. So these are highly, highly complex pieces to make. The flamboyance of the gilt bronze mounts and the malachite combined really put these creations in a unique category within the European decorative arts. And the mounts that we see on this particular piece, very much in the neo-rococo taste, are in fact in the records of the creation of the vase described as Chinese. And they were made in the Institute of Electropating and Bronze Work under the direction of Ivan Duval. And this was an institute which had in fact been started in 1844 by Nicholas I's son-in-law, Duke Maximilian von Lutenberg. 
It was um, Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna, the consort of Nicholas I, who had sent the very first monumental malachite vase to enter the royal collection in the 19th century. But this was not sent to uh, Queen Victoria, it was sent to her uncle, King George IV. And this vase was made to a design by Ivan Galberg, which you can see on the right of the screen. And his drawing also shows the wonderful uh, the options for the gilt bronze mounts, which you see down here. And we can see that ultimately the palmette motif uh, mounts were chosen. And what's also rather fascinating is that the pedestal of the vase was mounted on one side with the Russian imperial arms and on the other uh, with the British royal arms indicating that this was really very much a diplomatic piece with um, a very, delivering a very strong message. In fact, Malachite featured very strongly in the decoration of the rooms created for Nicholas I consort Alexandra. Um, and here we see a view of, uh, from that period from the 19th century, of the famous Malachite room in the Hermitage, which still exists there today, where you have this wonderful combination of a mix of bright green Malachite pillars and gilded plasterwork and mirrors, with creating this gloriously rich effect. George IV, um, who was evidently very pleased with this vase, had it uh, placed in the central window bay of the new large drawing room, now known as the Crimson Drawing Room, in his newly decorated apartments at Windsor Castle, where it's depicted in this watercolor by Joseph Nash. After the generally very happy relations between Britain and Russia of the 1830s and 1840s, Queen Victoria's reign would see one of the lowest points of British-Russian relations by the mid-1850s. The Crimean War of 1853-56, to 56, which pitted Russia against the British, the French, the Turks, and the Sardinians, is often called the First World War of the 19th century due to the severity of the conflict and the immense loss of life. Queen Victoria took a particularly close interest in the campaigns and also the welfare of her servicemen, and the war had a very long-lasting impact on her approach to Russia. On hearing of Nicholas I's death in 1855, she wrote in her journal, Poor Emperor, he has, alas, the blood of many thousands on his conscience. This incredibly powerful painting, which depicts a roll call after the Battle of Inkerman on the 5th of November, 1854, captured the public's imagination when it was exhibited at the Royal Academy in London in 1874. It was painted 20 years after the war itself had uh, concluded. And such was the intensity of interest and the strength of feeling that it actually required a policeman to stand by it constantly while it was on display. Its power, of course, lying in the fact that it conveys the reality of the suffering of the ordinary soldier in the aftermath of conflict. Queen Victoria decided to acquire the painting and she had it removed from the Royal Academy so that she could show it to Nicholas I's successor as Emperor, Alexander II, who was visiting England in May that year. By the time of her Golden Jubilee in 1887, Queen Victoria had married her heir apparent, the Prince of Wales, to the sister of the Russian Empress, and her second son to the only surviving daughter of Emperor Alexander II. This remarkable group portrait by the Danish artist Loritz Renier Tuxen is a powerfully dynastic image, encapsulating in oil the dynastic marriages which the Queen's children and grandchildren had made, largely due to her playing the role of the Grandmother of Europe, as she was often known, and acting as matchmaker, effectively manipulating the line of succession in virtually every royal and princely house of Europe. The Queen herself commissioned the painting from the Danish court painter Tuxen, whose 1885 group portrait um, of the King and Queen of Denmark she had much admired. This portrait was in fact painted for Queen Victoria's daughter-in-law, Alexandra of Denmark, who had married the Prince of Wales in 1863. And Alexandra's sister, uh, Dagmar, had married the future Emperor Alexander III of Russia three years later in 1866, taking the name Marie Fyodorovna on her conversion to the Russian Orthodox faith. And this united by marriage 
the royal families of Britain, Russia, and Denmark, who would meet annually, or at least annually, in Denmark at Fredensborg Palace, where this particular portrait was painted. The Queen formed a vast collection of portraits of her extended and immediate family, often commissioning copies of portraits from their own collections. This portrait of the Empress of Russia, Marie Fyodorovna, on the right of the screen, for example, she commissioned from the artist Robert Antoine Muller after the original in Marie Fyodorovna's possession, which was by Heinrich von Angeli. It was also during the latter part of Queen Victoria's reign, once these connections had been formed, that works by the renowned jeweler and goldsmith, Peter Karl Fabergé, began to enter the royal collection. Marie Fyodorovna and Alexander III were the first members of the Russian imperial family to commission works from the firm, including this frame with a portrait miniature of the Empress and this topaz and nephrite uh, portrait bust. And Queen Victoria herself, largely because she was influenced by her relatives in Denmark and Russia, began to purchase pieces from Fabergé her, um, herself, including miniature enameled and gem set eggs, which she would give to her extended family at Easter. The close family ties with uh, Russia, established in the 1860s, became closer still in the 1870s, when the only direct dynastic marriage between a child of the sovereign of the British royal family and a child of the Russian emperor took place. Queen Victoria's second eldest son, Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, was married to Maria Alexandrovna, the only surviving daughter of Alexander II. Aside from the rather complex and protracted negotiations over the marriage, this event caused a large influx of Russian works of art into the Queen's collection. The Emperor gave this portrait of his daughter to the Queen. And uh, until this point, of course, she had only seen her future daughter in photographs in black and white and uh, was not to meet her until three months after the couple were married in Russia. Queen Victoria described this portrait, which arrived by messenger from Russia, as the long-expected portrait, a lovely picture and beautifully painted. The artist, Gustav Richter, was a German working at the Russian court, and his portrait was copied in miniature and given as official presents from the couple um, as wedding gifts. And in her praise of the painting, Queen Victoria described it as beautiful and quite worthy of Winterhalter. And it does bear, in fact, a very striking resemblance to another portrait by Winterhalter of a Russian sitter in the royal collection. This really ravishing portrait of Grand Duchess Alexandra Yosifovna of Russia, wife of Emperor Alexander II's uh, uh, younger brother, um, is really a, a marvelous sort of tour de force by Winterhalter, once um, capturing at once the elegance of the sitter who was considered a great beauty, as well as conveying the wonderful textures of lace, silk, and pearls. And Richter appeared to borrow not only the pose, but also the interest in texture, albeit in a looser and more impressionistic way. The Queen placed that portrait, in fact, at the end of her dining table at Osborne House, surrounded by ribbons in the Russian colours, on the day of her son's wedding in the Cathedral Chapel of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. And she commissioned the Russian artist Nicolas Chevalier to record the marriage service in this painting. And in addition, the artist produced numerous sketches one of which Prince Alfred Duke of Edinburgh sent to his mother to enable her to understand the orthodox marriage ceremony. And you can see that this sketch actually has these paper flaps added um, at the front, which can be lifted, allowing the Queen to understand the different stages of the ceremony. And when he uh, wrote to the Queen, sent a telegram with this sketch, he said, I hope to be able to send sketches by Chevalier. By using the little additional slips, you will be able to follow the different parts of the service. When Queen Victoria finally met her new daughter-in-law in England, three months after the wedding, most of her concerns about the union were dissipated, and it was a relief that the general population, who were still feeling rather bruised after the Crimean War, seemed to accept the new royal princess. 
In the familial, political, and diplomatic negotiations prior to, to the Union, there had been many misgivings on both sides. In a letter written by the Queen's private secretary the previous year, he refers to the great many little difficulties and trouble, which considering she, i.e. Mary Fyodorovna, sorry, Mary Alexandrovna, is the spoilt daughter of a semi-Eastern despot, may grow into larger ones. Timed to arrive during Emperor Alexander II's first visit to see his recently married daughter in May 1874 were numerous gifts to different members of the royal family. And they included this particular personal gift to Queen Victoria, which uh, rather recalls the monumental hardstone vases presented earlier in her reign. This vase is based on a design for a silver two-handled cup, and it's cut from Corgan porphyry, particularly renowned for its violet gray hue and particularly beloved by Emperor Alexander II. While the base, um, as you can see, is in a contrasting stone, in fact, a green porphyry. And it also bears a very strong re resemblance, this base, to a much later pedestal, um, which was made to support a vase, uh, a vase made by the Fabergé firm, which is located here in New York, actually, thinking of works that are, are nearby that you might be able to see. And uh, this is a vase that is in the boardroom of the New York Stock Exchange and was a gift from Emperor Nicholas II in 1904 in gratitude for the launch of a bond that enabled him to raise millions of rubles to pay for the expansion of the Russian railway system. So this base uh, would be familiar if you ever have the opportunity to see that uh, particular piece. The vase and pedestal took 18 months to carve, and the vase in particular is remarkable for its crispness and subtlety, um, particularly in the interplay of matte and shiny surfaces that we see um, in the detail. Queen Victoria positioned the vase once again in pride of place in the crimson drawing room. You can see it just on the right of the screen there. Um, and this space, of course, had previously been occupied by George IV's Malachite vase, the gift of Alexandra Fyodorovna. The Russian Orthodox faith, faith of Maria Alexandrovna, Duchess of Edinburgh, prompted the only Russian architectural scheme in a British royal palace to be created. And this was made at the home she shared with Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, at Clarence House, uh, just alongside St. James's Palace. The interior, as you can see, was decorated in the traditional Russian style, and the iconostasis contained icons commissioned from the Russian painter Karl Timoleon von Neff, uh, that we met um, at earlier at the beginning of this talk. Designed purely for Maria's uh, personal devotion, the creation of the chapel was nonetheless really a diplomatic gesture on the part of the queen, who wrote, I have confidence that the marriage of my son with the daughter of the Russian emperor will serve to reaffirm the ties of friendship between two great Christian nations. The chapel was, in fact, uh, much later dismantled, and unfortunately, very little um, evidence of it survives within the current architectural scheme at Clarence House. The final dynastic marriage involving Queen Victoria's family with the Romanovs was between her favorite granddaughter, Princess Alix of Hesse, daughter of Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Alice, Duchess of Hesse, and, of course, with Emperor Nicholas II of Russia on the 22nd of, uh, 26th of November, 1894. On the day of their wedding, Queen Victoria stood at a dinner for the Russian anthem to be played while she was dining at Windsor Castle, and she reflected in her journal how impossible it seemed that gentle, little, simple Aliki should be the great Empress of Russia. The Queen once more commissioned Tuxen to capture the solemnity and beauty of the wedding, as well as to make careful likenesses of all those present, most of whom were her own relations. And Tuxen himself recorded in his autobiography how he was intoxicated by the beauty of the scene, the singing, the richness of the colours, the light and the golden fabrics. Among the numerous first-hand accounts of the preparations for the ceremony which were received by Queen Victoria was this letter uh, with sketches from the bride's sister, uh, Grand Duchess Sergei. 
and she describes how beautiful the bride will look, but also conveys the great sadness of the occasion, which took place just two weeks after the death of Alexander III, father of Nicholas. As Queen Victoria's long reign drew to an end, the strong family connections which she had forged dominated the relationship between the two sovereigns. But nonetheless, country and responsibility of state always came first. In October 1896, Nicholas and Alexandra made a visit to the Queen. It would be, in fact, the last time that they saw her. And she was at that moment resident at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Diplomatic talks were blended with family gatherings and military displays, as captured in an album of photographs which recorded the visit. <clears throat> a few months later, the imperial couple sent this silver gilt and enameled notebook case to the Queen, made by the Fabergé firm. The first page was inscribed by the couple with a dedication for Christmas, and the following year, the Queen chose to use the notebook for her Diamond Jubilee celebrations on the 22nd of June, 1897. And inside the following pages after the Queen's uh, own signature are recorded the signatures of every sovereign uh, and every royal prince or princess who attended the event. So it's really a very historic uh, document. Further gifts of Fabergé were sent by the couple, including this desk clock with panels of delicately engraved rock crystal. And the final piece that I would like to show you, this magnificent silver, gold, rose diamond and cabochon sapphire brooch. This was Nicholas and Alexandra's official diamond jubilee gift to mark Queen Victoria's uh, great milestone. In many ways, this jewel really sums up the subject of my lecture and the story of the long and complex relationship between Queen Victoria and Russia, with its resulting acquisition of Russian art, which now forms a part of the royal collection, and a selection of which I've had the pleasure of showing you this evening. Like the more monumental works of decorative art, the large porcelain vases, the huge hardstone carvings, it really encapsulates the best of contemporary Russian craftsmanship using the finest Russian raw materials. It is overtly Russian. Within the heart-shaped um, diamond mount are Slavonic characters subtly representing the figure 60 for the achievement of Queen Victoria's 60 years of reign. It also mimics the duality of the relationship, marking both a state occasion, but uh, acknowledging Queen Victoria's achievements. But the figure 60, as you can see, is held within a heart, reflecting the increasingly close dynastic and family ties between the respective sovereigns, which evolved during the century. The emperor and empress commissioned Karl Fabergé to make the brooch, showing once again the careful attention of donor to recipient, which characterized many of the Russian gifts given to the queen. And in acknowledgement, Queen Victoria herself chose to wear this special gift close to her own heart on the day she celebrated her diamond jubilee. In their telegram offering congratulations on the 23rd of June, 1897, Nicholas and Alexandra wrote these simple words, touched you wore our present. Thank you very much. <laughs>